You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. getting the chance to talk with Daniela from ilikedabble.com and today is going to be a little bit of a life hack, talent stack, geo arbitrage and life optimization story. It's it's really got a little bit of everything and I think what's really compelling about this is just that it seems like that awakening for Daniela was I would imagine something that would have been stark for any of us. You get laid off and then you pivot, you get in our industry and then you get laid off again. And maybe you got laid off that second time from like an industry that you thought was more or less recession proof or at least that was your first impression. And you realize if you're relying on someone else to provide you that security, then there's an issue. What can we do to build multiple streams of income? What can we do to build that resilience ourselves to make us bulletproof? And I think that is what gets me so excited about this episode. And help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. And, and yeah, it's interesting as you're describing that awakening moment, that's exactly what happened in my own life. And to a degree, it's, I saw what I thought was a recession proof industry and business and company fall apart. This was a worldwide accounting firm disappeared within a year of me starting. And I realized things are impermanent, right? And in Daniela's case, she obviously lost what she thought were safe jobs, right? And you just never know, which is why side hustles and passive income are so, so critical. And as you said, her story has a little bit of everything. And I'm excited to hear about living the life you want before you reach that point of phi and how the intersection of side hustles and passive income plays into that. So Daniela, with that, welcome to Choose a Phi. Hey, thanks so much for having me. All right, well, let's go ahead and talk about this. So tell us a little bit about your career choice and where you found yourself working when you got laid off for the first time. And just, was it a surprise? Was it a shock? I mean, give us a little sense for where you were when this when this moment happened. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I work in IT. At the time, I was working in retail IT. And I'd been at the company about four years. It was actually a company that my dad had worked at. And so the connection kind of brought me to that place after a while, but it was a company that did have a history of layoffs back from that crash that happened that when my dad was there and that's when he left. And over time it had changed. It was acquired by a couple of different companies. It was a wonderful job. It let me travel the world for the job that I had to do. And then one day they started bringing in something that was like, okay, here, start training all these people. So it was kind of coming, but we didn't really know for sure. And then one day it just laid off. They gave you a large kind of notice though. And then of course there were severance packages that were, was really helpful, but it, the timing was right as my wife and I got married. So I found out probably the weekend before we were actually going to leave for our wedding, which we had like, we eloped. We didn't have a, like an actual wedding. Then that September was my last day. And at the time, I was lucky to find a full-time remote job working as a contractor for the VA right afterwards. So I went right back into another job. I was really excited. The job had paid more anyway. It was a fun job, even though it was a little bit not as fast-paced as retail IT is a lot slower working with the VA. And then the administration came, and that's one thing I never thought about. And then, yeah, it just came out of the blue one day, and there was no severance, no PTO payout, nothing. They just said, your last day is tomorrow. So let's talk about that and then how that ties to your money story. So I'm going to just play this. I'm just trying to put myself in this situation. You work for the, in this one industry and we know this one industry retail, they're taking a beating. The retail apocalypse has been going on for a decade now and you get laid off and amazingly, you have this resilience. You bounce back, you land a job. Now you're in a recession proof industry. You've got, it's your dream job. It's just, you're loving it. And then no warning. Like at least with the other job, you kind of knew they weren't, they were on the ins and outs. They were getting beat up. But now with no warning, suddenly now this is ripped away. And I'm just curious from like a security perspective, from like, I want to take care of myself. I want to take care of my family. I want to be able to be a provider. How did that make you feel in terms of your confidence levels of being able to handle your money and create a plan for yourself going forward? Yeah, it completely kind of ruined me and my self-esteem and my confidence. So when my first layoff happened, 
we were basically the paycheck to paycheck kind of thing. We were spending too much. We were still in a lot of debt. And we were in one of those phases where I would go to the thrift store and sell random stuff just to get gas money until my next paycheck. And then we were kind of ramping up like our financial situation to be a little bit more stable right when that happened. So we did have some emergency fund and it was okay. And my wife had her job. The thing was this new job, it was my first government job. And Everybody else I worked with were people that had mostly government experience. And they seemed like, oh, this happens all the time. You'll find a new contract. It's not a big deal. But the company I was working with, all of my work was on those contracts that got cut. So they couldn't keep my position. And it's just all those things that you never think about. You never think about administration change when you work in the government, especially for a company that does contracts. If you're there for under a year, you're not going to get any severance. Those companies don't do PTO. They kind of have, you know, wonky benefits. So you need to like before you take those kind of jobs, maybe you do need to do a little bit more research. And I should have done that too, but you know, you, you never really can predict the future. Yeah. So this is, I mean, really a powerless type position, right? Like you're now at this point of this financial low. And I, I'm curious, like, you know, Jonathan asked, what does that feel like? And and where do you, where do you go from there? Like, where were you financially at that point? So sure. You had the severance from the first job for a little bit, no severance from the second job. Were there ever those like dire financial moments? Were you in debt? Was it paycheck to paycheck like that? Like, where were you, I guess, precisely? And then was there an awakening financially? Because it, you know, it didn't sound like you're in a strong position. It sounded like you're in a position like everybody else, right? Like kind of <laughs> just getting along, but clearly between there and here, you appearing on Choose the Fi talking about your story, something must have happened. So I'd love to hear about where you were financially and then where that awakening happened. Well, first, after a breakdown, I had my wife to kind of talk me down. And then we did look at our finances and she's like, hey, look, we have enough money. It's not going to be a problem. I was like, I need to make sure that I am somehow contributing to my own financial burden, which is my debt. And I didn't have another job lined up. So, I mean, from there, you know, we looked at the emergency funds that we had. Thankfully for that severance from the first layoff was still there. And me not taking the advice from my parents to be like, take time off. You have severance. You'll be able to use that. Good thing I did jump into that job and keep the severance as emergency fund because that really was, you know, helped me kind of keep sane and motivated to look for a job right away, as well as take on some freelance work in between to keep stable in my mind, at least. Now, that's actually interesting because, you know, your brand is I like to dabble. And before this, you just had two jobs. We're not really talking about a whole lot of side hustling. And now for the first time, we're talking about freelancing here. I'm curious, like, was this a skill set that you had already developed? Did you already have a base of clients to reach out to? It sounds like you were able to, at least from your perspective, you know, help with your side of the finances by doing some freelancing, how did you go about reactivating those clients and building up your body of work? Yeah. So I had experience freelancing actually after my first job out of college. And it was with a client that I'd worked with at that first job. It was non-compete kind of agreement violation stuff. It was just somebody that I knew. And at the time I kind of just reached out to them via email and I was like, Hey, do you need any WordPress development stuff done? I have some time open as I'm looking for a new job. Danielle, we talk a lot on the show about our talent stack the various skills that we've built up over a lifetime that while we might not necessarily be world-class at, we're in the top, let's say 20% of each of these and these various skills. You just said WordPress. You said before you were in retail IT. So obviously there's, there's an IT background. What type of skills have you built up to make you a more valuable employee or contractor? Like when someone would ask you, if, if I were to ask you, Hey, Daniela, w- like you may never have heard this phrase before talent sack, but like what's in your talent sack? Like what makes you valuable that you've been able to build up all these streams of passive income? Yeah. So my talent stack isn't only technical. I have a, a strong artistic background and design background. It's mostly come from being self-taught, but I did minor in web design while I was in college. Um, it wasn't anything that was heavy on the enterprise side. Like people that are professional designers now, but it was something that did help me basically build up my talent stack and the different kind of IT jobs I've had over the years. I never had a job where I'm doing the same exact duties at every job or using the same code or like there's jobs that I had where I wasn't even a coder. For the VA, I was a database administrator. So so that was something I'd never actually done before for any job. It was just, they were hiring for it. So I went for it. I was like, I have experience doing this for WordPress websites. How hard could it be for other stuff? Huh. Okay. That's fascinating. I just went for it. Like, tell me, what does that look like when you apply for that job? And when you interview, what do you say with, you know, the background that you have of being, okay, I'm kind of tangentially related here, but like, here's why you should give me this job. Like, what, you know, 
tell the audience member like what they should be telling somebody on their next job interview. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the thing in IT is that a lot of jobs, you kind of end up wearing a lot of hats. So something like database administration. Now there are jobs that are completely just database administration. But when I was working in retail IT, the position I had, I was doing so many different things. I was doing coding on their mobile app. I helped create sort procedures with the vendor for the app that we were doing. And I did a lot of intensive heavy work in the database because we didn't have database administrators because retail IT likes to do stuff lean because they don't have a lot of money. So I had that kind of little bit of experience, even though it wasn't like heavy of full database administration, making sure that, you know, you keep space in check and that kind of thing. And then with my own past experience with WordPress site databases, which are completely different because I was doing MySQL database stuff and then my PHP admin stuff, which is a way too technical talk. <laughs> um, but when I went for that job at the VA, they first posted as like a system admin kind of job, but all the duties were like all over the place. And I was like, well, this kind of isn't that far off of what I was doing before. I'm going to go for it anyway. And then we were talking and he's like, it's going to be really heavy database administration stuff. What's your experience in database administration? And I was like, so I just told him straight up exactly what I've done and all the different kind of scenarios I had to morph and just adapt to in my job previously with uh, database administration. And the fact that I had that experience where not only working in the database, but I had the experience of working in that same application that the database is, you know, connected to <laughs> and the client and everything. So, you know, he's like, okay, we definitely need something like this because there's a lot of variables in this project that we're not sure of. So this experience is actually perfect for this. So I'd be, when you're going for a job interview, definitely be upfront about all the experience you have. Try to think and write it all down before. You don't want to leave anything out because, I mean, trust me, it's not going to be too much information for them. You know, I think one of the things, especially if you're starting to internally use verbiage like a talent stack, is that you recognize your ability to learn anything you want to learn. Not that you're going to be in the top 1% of anything, but you're like, all right, I kind of see the common patterns between one type of business and another, the common needs that they all have. The actual process that they may use may be slightly different from one to one, but I understand where they want this to go. And I understand what I have now and what maybe one or two additional skills I might need to really be able to deliver for them. And that no longer seems overwhelming because the only reason I don't know it to this point is I just haven't had an, a, a selfish reason to lean into it yet, but I'll take what I have now. You'll get a ton of value. I'll quickly scale up in these two other reasons. And I know what your end goal is based on, you know, all the common patterns I've observed at this point. So we'll get there really quick. And your confidence to like, understand that will come through in an interview. And even if you haven't done this exact one thing, because you know what their goals are and you know what's going to get them there, you can get whatever job you want. I mean, that's kind of what I've noticed myself. And I suspect for you, yeah, you hadn't done that exact title job before, but you flirted around it with all the talent stack that you've been building. This is not going to be a stretch. We got this. Oh yeah, absolutely. And when you're looking at jobs and they list all these requirements or all the different duties that you'll be doing, and there's like two, three or four or five lines. We're like, I've never heard of that before. Still apply for it and still go for it because they're not looking for people that have necessarily experience in every single one of line items like that. They're looking for people that are willing to learn, collaborate with team members. Cause I mean, every company and every job is different and you're not going to walk in knowing absolutely everything to do the job that day, especially in IT. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so interesting. It, what you said uh, about a minute or two ago, you said, just be honest with them, right? Like that is just so critical. And I think so many people go into job interviews thinking they need to wow the person on the other side of the table, that they are the number one subject matter expert in X. And that might simply not be what they're looking for, right? Which is actually really interesting. Like your ability to adapt was what they needed, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't need the best person at just simply this narrow database management. They needed someone oh, yeah. who had a variety of skills. And, you know, it's funny, like, I think in my own mind, if, if you'll uh, allow me to indulge with my accounting background, it's, I would say I'm not even a top 50% CPA in terms of technical ability, but I can explain things to regular people that they actually will understand it. Whereas there are many CPAs who are vastly better than I am at the technical stuff but it just sounds like jargon when it comes out of their mouth. So people's minds shut down. Mm -hmm. So what is actually more valuable? Like you could make an argument for either way, frankly, and both are valuable. I think that- I'll make an argument probably, for you, brother. I'll do that. I'll do oh, that for you. I'll, I'll make an argument for you. <laughs> I appreciate it. But no, but I think the key part is both are valuable. 
right? And I'm not just, thanks. I, I do appreciate it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I see the big uh, ironic smile on your mouth. But, uh, <laughs> but seriously, like, Daniela, in this case, it's the exact same thing with you, right? Like, you weren't walking in there saying, I am the world-class expert at X. And so many people get caught up in that when they apply for a job. Like, I need to be the best. And sometimes being able to explain it, sometimes being able to have a variety of backgrounds and being able to synthesize different pieces of information from various aspects of your life, like that's the value. So I really wanted to dial in on this because I need the audience to hear this. It's critical that we all understand like there is a little bit of everything that provides value and you just have to be honest, open, and you have to know yourself as well. Let's talk about your actual financial game plan here. So I want to talk about how side hustling enters into it. So we talked about freelancing just a little bit here, and we kind of have this backdrop that two jobs have kind of been ripped away and you've realized that you don't need to just have one employer. You know, you can keep your head above water just with a few freelance clients, but that opens up the door to, wow, maybe there's some security in multiple streams of income. And I want to talk about, you know, you dabbled with that and where that took you, but also how, what impact that had on your practical finances. You were carrying around a decent amount of consumer debt. Yeah. Your emergency fund was in place and you were able to do that. Plus the freelancing to keep your head above water. But I mean, you have a backdrop of some pretty significant consumer debt. How did all of this come together? So the freelancing after my second layoff, that was just something out of panic because I was looking for jobs. I needed some way to bring money in. And I'm just one of those people where it's like, I feel like a failure if there is no money coming in. So that was more of a panic move. And this is also after my blog has already started, but it's not bringing a lot of money in. And it wasn't something I was going to be like, oh, I'm going to go try to do this full time right now. And with the state of our finances, I actually didn't even know we were in such a dire state. I was like, everybody's got debt. We're going to be okay. And then I started to think about, oh my God, what about retirement? Because I wasn't aggressive with my retirement contributions beforehand either. So I was like, okay, I just need to get a grip on it. So out of the panic move, I had a little bit of a job going on where I could make some money until I found a job that was stable enough and long-term because I was still in the mindset then where it's like the only reason to, only way to go forward is a job. I need a job with a company. I wasn't thinking about self-employment. I wasn't thinking about FI. I wasn't even thinking about debt payoff. <laughs> we weren't thinking about any of that stuff really besides like being comfortable with an emergency fund because we were still... Like that was the number one thing we always made sure we wanted to have from that first layoff. So what changed was I found another job and then I started reading up a lot on personal finance. With my blog at the same time, I was trying to, like it was first going to be like a blog of our journey with kind of getting our financial ish together. But I stepped away from it for six, eight months and I just did a lot of reading and a lot of searching, getting a job at a fintech company was kind of the aha moment, which is weird because it's the job that I eventually want to leave. But they're the ones that, I mean, kind of gave me a lot of the resources to get our butts moving. Hey, this is Andrew from Choose FI. Make sure you stay tuned to hear about how Daniela built out multiple streams of income with her gift for dabbling right after these quick messages. So dabbling is a huge part of your identity. It's actually quite literally what you build a brand around on the internet. Like what gets us from being blissfully unaware, kind of okay with our saving emergency fund and hoping that, you know, we can just make it to the next paycheck to now having the bandwidth to say, I'm going to build out multiple streams of income and do so with an intentional path to get to financial independence. Oh, right. So I've been dabbling basically since I started my career, since I was in high school, actually. It's always kind of been in the background. It's always been something I've done on the on the side. And it was never something that I thought that I could utilize to create multiple streams of income, you know, build actual wealth, invest, and even think about financial independence. I'd never even put two and two together until I started reading up and really educating myself on personal finance, reading stories from others, how they did similar things with creating multiple streams of income. And I came to the realization where it's like, all right, I've always had these to fall back on. And if I didn't, what would have happened? And if I didn't have these, I probably wouldn't have been able to build half the skills that I have now or even build the career that I was able to build now. And that was probably the aha moment where it's like, all right, you're able to do this, this and this. Why not create some sort of, you know, passive income stream or build more passive income streams? build them up over time. And then I won't have to depend on all these different moving factors of jobs and layoffs. And then our future finally got clear about what we wanted to do rather than what we have to do. Wow. 
That is so cool. I mean, that is the story of Phi, right? Which is the power and autonomy are now on your side of the ledger. And what's interesting is you had this in the background since high school. And you just, like you said, you didn't kind of put two and two together that this could be the path out as opposed to just a little bit of dabbling. And so, okay, you've kind of said like, I had these dabbles or whatever we want to call them in the past. Like, what were they? I'm so, I'm fascinated. I'm like sitting here on the edge of my seat. Like, Daniela, tell me what they are already. You know, like, what have you been doing that clearly this is part of your talent stack, right? You said this helped you build the career you've built and it wouldn't have been possible without the dabbling. So tell me where you started. Oh yeah. So I started, um, not doing productive side hustles. So I like to call my side hustling in high school, more like toxic side hustles. Cause they were ones that fueled my spending behavior because I would get my money, my paycheck from my, the movie theater I worked at. Then that in a weekend, I'd be like, Oh, it's all right. I can go sell some stuff here. I'll go buy some stuff here and resell it here. You know, it was like to make up for my bad decisions, which, you know, that eventually went away. You were I was, decluttering they, so you could consume more. <laughs> that literally, it was like the most contradictive high schooler behavior. I don't know what, but <laughs> over time, the side hustles kind of morphed into like fun things I was doing on the side that, oh, I can make money doing. I mean, freelancing originally was just WordPress development stuff I was doing because I had left that first job out of college and I was waiting tables and I wanted more money. So I had found some freelancing gigs with somebody I had known from a past job. So over the years from high school to now, I guess the different ones are like selling at thrift stores and thrift store flipping. That's probably the first one I've ever really known about because that was from my own I guess, compulsive shopping behavior that I used to have when I was in high school, which is so weird because I don't buy anything now. I guess like clothes wise and stuff I don't, but I used to all the time. That was the first one. And it's the one that we still do today. My wife is the expert in that one. And she resells guitars on eBay for profit. Also uses other apps like Reverb for that. So reselling is a big one for us. You know, before reselling though, it was decluttering and selling or just selling (laughs) anything I could find. Freelance web development and web design. That was one of the early on ones you know, after college and after that first job. Um, I've done other really weird ones. Like I bought PlayStations off of Craigslist, ones that I know that I could repair. A lot of like little minor repairs and I would repair them and then resell them on Craigslist or eBay. I had did painting. So I am a self-taught painter and I would go to concerts and do live painting and bring finished paintings with me. And then people would just come up and offer whatever they wanted. That was more of a fun thing. It was things that my friends and families went to anyways, and I could just go for free because I'd be like, I'm going to paint at this. Is that okay? And they're like, sure. Wow. Yeah. It's just a lot of really weird stuff. So just to clarify one tiny <laughs> little thing there. I wanted to go to the concert. My family and friends are going to the concert and I took my artistic tools, paintbrush, easel, canvas, whatever it may be. And I brought that with me and said, Hey, would you let me come? paint this live event, hashtag exposure, hashtag like good thing to have about your event. And they would say, not only can you come, let us give you a free ticket. Is that what actually happened? Was there any sort of pattern there? I just, I just want to clarify you're building your talent stack. They're giving you free tickets. Am I missing something? No. So the only thing you're missing is these concerts aren't like huge concerts. Like they're not like Cardi B or Beyonce. I can't get into those for free, but (laughs) they're like little concerts at little venues, the kind of venues that are like, you know, There's a bar and a stage, maybe the same ones that are at the improv places, you know, little ones. There was um, a couple artistic festivals for like either bluegrass or like EDM or kind of like just like chill music that would happen a lot outside. So I could go there and paint and get in for free. So they would just give you like volunteer passes rather than tickets. Yeah, I just want to clarify the get in for free mechanism. How how did that, what was the actual exchange of value that happened there? Was it, hey, can I come paint? Well, I just don't, I don't quite understand how you show up with artboard, easel, and paintbrushes and you're in for free. I've just never seen that before. Maybe you can help me with that. Yeah, so I would go into the actual venue beforehand. This is a couple of years before. People didn't Instagram DM to ask for things back then. I had to actually physically go there. These are places that I knew that live painters went to anyway. I've been there in the past and I saw people painting live, doing different kind of things and doing like entertainment sort of things too. So I would just go up there and be like, hey, for this show on this date, do you have any room where I can set up for this amount of time? And they'd be like, you know, yay or nay. And then you get a volunteer pass. Okay. Something here, you know, it's small, tuck it away, useful tactic strategy, maybe a little bit, maybe it's known to everybody except for us, Brad. And was like, oh yeah. Everybody. Well, it is a little pre COVID too. So <laughs> this is it probably is not something that is seen as much anymore. <laughs> Nobody's seen as much anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <Nope>. so, <laughs> 
So you're a dabbler, and we mentioned uh, several of them, not the least of which is I am a WordPress developer, and I've added value to companies by helping them do various things. And if I can do it for them, every talent stacker knows if you can do it for them, you can do it for yourself. You know, and so there's that aspect. You can start building up this resilience for yourself. And you, in fact, have done this. And I'm curious now, you're, you know, you landed a, a new job. You're working for a fintech company. They're, you know, in a pretty resilient industry, even during COVID, most of the tech companies, except for WeWork, but they were calling themselves tech. Are they tech? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. But <laughs> most of the tech companies doing pretty good right now. So, you know, you have some resilience baked in with your job currently. Having said that, if this job were to go away, contrast the position that you find yourself in now. You have this anchor of financial independence being a goal. You have several years of traction now working towards this. And you have this side hustle, this underpinning of your, of your resilience coming from your side hustles. How would you feel and how is your, your situation different now compared to the before if your job were to suddenly be ripped away? Oh, that's a good question. So the financial position we're in now is completely different. We have one year of emergency fund saved up. All of our debt is paid off. And both of us have side hustles that we run on the side that are still able to kind of run if we're not, you know, actively doing them all the time. So if we were to lose our job, well, I guess if I were to lose my job, my blog makes a third of what my income is at my full-time job. And I have avenues of areas I could reach out to to probably add more work into that and definitely ramp it up if I need to. So having the skills and working up this side hustle of mine over the last three and a half years gives me an added sense of security if I were to lose everything right now. And it definitely goes to show you that if you start working at this now, which means don't go run out and start a blog by any means, don't do that. But like, look at your current job. Do they have free training that they offer? Maybe LinkedIn learning. That's part of one of their benefits. Start building on some of the skill sets that you like doing. Don't try to force yourself on the ones that you don't like doing or learn new ones that go well hand in hand with those. Definitely start reaching out to online networks. So that's a huge piece to my side hustle is this huge online network I was able to kind of get into and build these relationships with people online that I know if I were to lose my job today, they can help me get more work. And some of these came from people within my own job, um, past freelance clients and people that I've just worked with. And now online Facebook groups, Reddit groups, Twitter is huge for networking. Definitely just go on Twitter, search through hashtags, and then other areas to find like free online learning for skills. Udemy is great for that. And Coursera has some free courses as well. Google Digital Garage, that's, you know, digital marketing or digital online stuff is your thing. Yeah, just start researching and just seeing what you can maybe transfer from your full-time job into some sort of just little side venture. Don't make it that it's going to take up another extra eight hours of every single day. You don't want to burn out right away. Just got to just start doing little things every day or every other day or every week. Daniel, I feel like we can do an entire episode on what you just said in the last 60 seconds. This is fascinating to me. So online networking groups, talk me through like, what do people do? Where do they start with that? What did you do specifically? Like there's something really here because you're talking about, you're not doing this when you've lost the job and it's this oh no moment. This is, you are laying the groundwork to create a network in times of plenty, if you will, right? When things mm -hmm. are good, talk us through like how someone would go about that. Like, what do you think the first one or two places would be to start? So I started with actually Twitter and I started messing around with the different hashtags. So I would look at like freelance developers or freelance just freelance or um, the writers community, since I did get into freelance writing after I started my blog, or like writers wanted. We just mess around with different hashtags. Um, of oh. course, personal finance, since my blog is like personal finance, finding the personal finance Twitter community was because I looked at PF Twitter hashtag. And that's where a lot of those relationships came from. And I was on Twitter before, like really Instagram or anything else, even though Instagram now is huge for networking and building relationships. And you could do that same kind of hashtag research on Instagram. I think this is an entire part of my talent stack that's missing. Like, so let me just context. I love Facebook groups. I get so much value. If there's a skill that I want to learn, lean into the respective Facebook groups. I understand in theory, in some sectors, how LinkedIn could be particularly valuable for networking. Like I can just see it now Facebook I use. So I obviously, I understand the value that I personally benefited from it in so many different areas of my talent stack. LinkedIn, I do not use. Uh, I mostly just solicited on, on LinkedIn. It's not particularly helpful for me and I don't use it, but I see how in, for some individuals in some industries, wow, that is like a superpower. So I, I understand that I have never, 
Like literally until this moment in my life. Now I'm trying to really hype it up now, but this moment in my life considered networking or finding jobs on Twitter or Instagram. It would never have occurred to me. And I'm beyond interested in one and like how you knew that was even a thing. And then two, what do you actually do? Are these DM, like, like, like Twitter gives you 230 characters. Most of them are hashtags. <laughs> Instagram gives you one link. And like, I, I don't even, I can't even fathom how you could practically build a strategy around finding a job and building like really, is it just becoming friends with people who know things? I could see that on Twitter maybe, but like, yeah. tell me more. You just like, talk to people. <laughs> you talk to people. I mean, Twitter's just a bunch of strangers talking to people anyway. So you just start talking to people, jumping into things that are interesting to you. The reason I actually found the Plutus Foundation was Twitter. I started talking to them on Twitter, and now I'm one of their freelance writers because they reached out to me on right, so Twitter. Are there maybe industries like write, freelance writing specifically that lends this? Like, I'm just wondering, let's just play this out for IT specifically. Yeah. I'm interested in getting a job in IT. Would I go to Twitter for mm -hmm. IT? Like, is that a thing? So I'm an old school IT freelancer where I found my first freelance gigs on Craigslist under the gig section. This is back in 2011, 2012. Now I would find those on Facebook groups, like you said, because yeah. there are a bunch of IT freelancer web development groups. Like just go to Facebook and you type it in IT freelance or freelance web dev and filter on groups. There's a ton of them. And I think Facebook is probably one of the good ones for that. People will say Upwork or Fiverr, but it takes a lot of time to put into it to get, create a profile and start reaching out for gigs, which if you have the time to put into it, definitely do that. But you will find the network, um, those networks at least, that don't take the time to go on those kind of platforms on Facebook. But yeah, for freelance gigs, Twitter is especially good. And then Instagram is just good for anything because people are expecting people to slide into their DMs, I guess, and their comments. And it depends on the kind of person, though, if they respond to you or not. But then also people always post job openings for like their small business or their friend's small business or just people that they know. Like I found two communities through Instagram. One is the We All Grow Latina community, the Mujerista community. Oh, sorry, one more. Ladies Get Paid community. So they all have like different platforms they use for their community. There's Slack or like Mighty Networks. And there's one that like you just get the emails for all the updates of what's going on. And they'll post freelance jobs they know about, other jobs they know about, you know, free workshops, free webinars for skill development, negotiation, all that kind of stuff. Do you think that based on a pattern you're seeing that freelancing is increasingly becoming an extended interview portal? Like if you want to start getting access to some of these big companies that are looking for rock star talent that potentially looking for a free, like I just noticed the pattern there. You got a freelance gig as a contractor. You, got, you were working as a contractor with a company. You're a rock star. They picked you up full time. And I'm just wondering if this is becoming increasingly ubiquitous where these freelancing opportunities are available, they're being spread in mass. Like, is that something that people should really look at, even if they're not looking for freelancing, but they're looking at a gateway to get access to a great company? Yeah. So that's, let me just first separate two things that you said there. You said freelance and contracting. So in tech industry here in Missouri, when they say a contractor, you work for that contracting company. You're not necessarily a freelancer. You're just representing the contracting company at that company that you're working at. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was a contractor at my now job, I came representing the contracting company. And then over time, they offered me a full-time position with the as a permanent employee with that actual company, which is different. You know, from freelancing, maybe you do work for a freelance client. For an example, when I worked for a web startup as a freelancer, and I did only like a specific set of duties. It was very minimal, you know, like 10 hours a week. They didn't really have, I guess, a way to offer me the job because they did tell me up front, we're hiring freelancers for all of these things because we can't afford to hire full-time people for them. So, I mean, in a place like St. Louis, where I live currently, this whole thing in the tech industry, which is called like these contracting companies, is kind of a big thing. And it probably is in other cities too, where there are companies that aren't, I don't know why they do it, but a lot of their new hires won't be all actual employees. They'll be these contractors. And they'll, they'll, usually the span of this contracting thing lasts for two years. That's usually like the cap for it, unless they extend you for yada, yada, yada reason. Some of them do have the option to, I guess it's contract to hire. So you can contract with the company for a while, and then they have the option to offer you the position if they like you or not. And then other ones, they will distinctly say that, no, this is a contract only position. There won't be a way to hire on fully. But while you're there, you're free to look at the internal positions available. If there's one that sparks your interest to hire there, which is a great opportunity, you know, a great way to get into a good company for sure. <clears throat> well, 
I stand corrected on freelancing versus contracting and uh, my knowledge base is better for it. So thank you for that. Um, you know, give people a sense now for your, your three or four years into your, your financial independence journey, you've built up your side hustle, you've increased your income, your talent stack is strong and you've got your goals are aligned. You and your wife are working towards financial independence. Where do you go from here? What's the plan? What are you as a couple working towards? Currently, we're working towards moving cross country to fulfill this dream that we've had for the past couple of years. So we've traveled many times up to like the Olympic National Forest. We love the area up of like Gig Harbor, Bremerton, Port Orchard area that's kind of north of Tacoma. So we are looking at houses there to move, which is a huge um, housing cost difference from Missouri, of course, but we have found a way that it won't be that big of a difference and our cost of living won't actually go up. The only thing is our mortgage will go up, which we are prepared for, but our cost of living will basically remain the same. So that doesn't really impact any of our goals besides, you know, it would be a little bit more difficult if I were to lose my job while we're out there. Since I do work remote full time, I'm able to work from anywhere. Um, there would just be a little bit more panic of like, oh no, the mortgage, but you know, we'll be fine because of all of this stuff we have to fall back on. And this is something we didn't want to do until we were more financially independent. But at that time, I wasn't a full-time remote worker that had this kind of flexibility. So that has been able to give us this thing that we've wanted to do forever. And this whole year, we've been working towards it, redoing parts of our house, um, selling our house. So the goal is to leave my full-time job. My wife is 100% on board of getting leaving her full-time job. She is somebody that does love her job very much. And she just isn't somebody who is planning to flip guitars full-time or, you know, for forever. She is also a little bit older than me. So she is, you know, closer to that retirement age than I am. I'm not somebody who wants to wait until 65 for, for all this stuff though. And I am looking to, when I do leave my full-time job, definitely work on the blog continuously. Who knows it'll be the same blog or not do freelance work, that sort of thing, and use our income from our investments. So this still kind of like, it's an evolving goal because it was different originally when we weren't planning on moving, but it's really important to us that, you know, we've lived in the same city our whole life. And this is a place that we, we felt that we've always belonged at. So right now that's the big goal. And then we will tweak, you know, we need to get definitely more comfortable and feeling like we're settled in our new space. And then we will reassess everything again to have like a clear goal of what, what we will do. So it's not like a clear, like five by this date, never work again. It's going to be flexible. Right. But that's the beauty of the path to five, right? Is you can reassess and you're doing it from a position of strength, right? Yeah. Things change and you realize, oh, we actually, this is really important to us to make this move, right? And you can do that from this position of strength, especially when you're full-time remote and you have all these side hustles. I mean, I, I absolutely love that aspect of the story and there's no one size fits all for that path to fly. It's whatever works for you and your life. So I say bravo. I mean, I think that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. So if someone's listening to this and they want to connect with you, they want to find out a little bit more about your story, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so you can contact me through I like to dabble.com or find me on anywhere online, like Twitter, Instagram. I'm, I like to dabble, just type it and you'll find me. And yeah, I definitely respond pretty easily to emails, DMs, whatever. I'm always there. I'm gonna message you on Twitter. I can find out more about this <laughs> finding gigs through Twitter. This is like shocking to me. I'm like, I yeah, gotta... that was revolutionary. <laughs> yeah, if you, I mean, yeah. if you look at the hash, I mean, for freelance writers, it's definitely a big one. I know for designers too, for IT, probably not so much just because, I mean, there's a couple of hashtags like writers wanted or I can see the threads for writers. I really writers can. I can see the threads yeah. for writers, but that is like, or designers like, wanted. That's another one. Graphic okay. designers wanted. Awesome. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. All right, everyone, I hope you got value from today's episode. If you are trying to figure out, you know, I love this idea of financial independence, but how do I get started? Let me encourage you, go to chooseify.com slash start. Get started on your path to financial independence today. Best time to start 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Second best time right now, get started. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.